Welcome to This Old App, a podcast about learning, coding, smashing stuff together, breaking things apart, startups, failing, winning, and any other buzzwords we can think of. Good afternoon, Randy. How are you doing today? Doing well. How are things going on your end? Doing real well. About to take a, a, a week and a half trip to Atlanta. So um, that'll be that'll be interesting and fun. Um, so today we have a, a guest with us. We have Renee Lahoff with us. Uh, welcome, Renee. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. Sure. So Renee is uh, formerly um, in her in her past was a game developer, a, a lead developer on on a few different games. Um, took some time away and then is learning learning the industry all over on a new game engine. Is that uh, does that sound about right, Renee? That is correct. Um, awesome. I really have a passion for introducing coding to women and girls through programming games. Um, in pursuit of that, most recently, I attended a hackathon for games. I joined a local indie game developer group and have begun blogging about these experiences. Very good. So so game development is something Randy and I have no <laughs> experience in. Um it, it, at, at one point, I, I did do one minor AI game-like thing for a, for a fantasy site. So I had to do a little bit of uh, AI thinking uh, along the gaming lines, but nothing about gaming engines or anything like that. So this will be fun to dive into. So talk a little bit, if you would, about um, how you got started. What, what brought you to the game development world? It was... I was out in California and I was in my first job actually as an electrical engineer. That's what my bachelor's was in. And my boyfriend at the time, who is now my husband, took, we went to one of those computer fairs they had back then. And that's, you know, imagine a craft fair where you have all these booths with crafts, except for in this case, every booth had basically PC game parts and you would buy at once, at one little um, booth, you would buy your monitor. At another booth, you would pick up your power supply, and you would build your own computer. I, I, I remember going to a fair like that. It's been <laughs> it's been a few years, but yes, I remember doing exactly that. Yeah. So my husband and I built our built computers that way, and brought bought some brand new games at that time. Sid Meier's Civilization had just come out, and I instantly became addicted. And I was already in love with coding. I was doing it for my job. And I thought, wow, I think the best job in the world would be coding these games. So I went and got a master's in computer science at night on the side. I bought myself a ticket to the Game Developers Conference out there in San Jose. When I graduated, I went out there. I interviewed, got myself a Game Developers job out in Austin, Texas. Oh, nice. Very nice. So, so, um, like I said, you were, you, you worked your way up to, to being lead developer for, for a few games. What, what was the, um, so nowadays you hear, you hear the unity engine and the unreal engine as far as, uh, game engines are what back then, what, what were there game engines that you were working with or, or was it, uh, each company had their own thing going. At that time, for the most part, each company had its own thing going. It definitely did at the first, uh, the first game company I worked at. It was all built up from scratch. That job, they, uh, the project I was on got canceled you know, less than a year after I joined that company. So when I was laid off, there was actually, because Austin was a bit of a game company mecca, uh, just down the floor below in the same building was another game company. I went downstairs. I, w I interviewed with them. Turns out they had just landed a Barbie game with Mattel, but none of their male programmers wanted to work on it. Huh. <laughs> so I, I went down there and I said, yes, absolutely. I will, I will be, I will work on your Barbie game. In fact, I will be your lead programmer on your Barbie game. So I just, <laughs> it's not very often in the development world that you get to leverage the fact that you're female. But in that case, 
it was a real selling point to walk myself right up into in not only a job, but a step up. And well, nice. Can I can I rewind a little bit? Because I want to go back to you got a degree in computer science, but did they teach you game development in that program? Like what was the transition you made into no understanding gaming? Because I don't think they teach that now in computer science or boot camps at the present time. No, and I still don't think that in a standard uh, computer science degree, you can't get that now. Yeah. Locally, locally, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Carnegie Mellon is here, and they have actually opened up what's called the ETC, I believe it stands for Entertainment Technology Center, and they actually give out um, computer science slash uh, game development degrees mm -hmm. that are you know, either computer science or art related. But at that time, no, my, I simply specialized within my computer science degree for software development. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the game developers convention, I simply sold myself both in the fact that I had a computer science degree and that I was a, a passionate game player. So I understood mm -hmm. what, what would make a good game. So you like, did you study because, yeah, I mean, I've, I've played lots of games, but I definitely don't understand, like, what really makes... I don't understand the machinations of it or, the, like, how they operate um, on the kind of design level. So did you just study by playing, or did you dive into kind of how games are engineered yourself? It was really on my first job when I got hired as the you know, one of the junior developers in, in the game industry, they simply, you know, the first thing they did, they had a game that was part way along. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, you know, one thing that hasn't been done yet in this game is that none of our little sounds are playing. It was a game called, that was when golf games really got, were really big for a while. So they, yeah. they said, okay, we're going to make a game called lunar golf. You're golfing on the moon. So there would be these little, um, sounds that would play when you hit the ball or the the game would comment that you made a hook or a slice and these things needed to be put into the play at the right times in the game and that's mm -hmm. just you know that was my first exposure it was just i had to look at the pre-existing code figure out when these things were happening that the user hit the ball it, it was going to go in this particular direction and i would plug in those sounds so it was just gradual exposure. Each game yeah. I worked on, I learned a little bit more from working on it. I mean, I because you obviously you talk to a lot of newcomers into just development period. And even I, when I talk to folks I'm teaching, they talk about game development like it's something they have to take a college course in. And I think you can prove that it's self-learning is a big part of it. Um, or getting experience without having a formal game degree, even if they may exist now. But the but there's lots of people that have been like that, but your track record definitely shows that you don't have to learn games um, formally to actually be able to develop them. I really don't think so, because you think about it, you get a, some type of computer science degree or you learn how to make a website. If you know how to make a website, you can make pretty much any website. Yeah. It's not like if you were making a website for a hospital, did you have to get also a medical degree to make a website for a hospital? Yeah. You can apply your coding knowledge to a different type, you know, a specific type of problem. You know, coding is all problem solving. And the problem solving in, in games are just some different types of problem solving. Yep. So it, after after you were doing doing all that game development, um, I believe you made a change and decided to dedicate your time to to raising your daughter uh, at the time. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Okay, and how old is your daughter now? She is turning nineteen this week. Awesome. Yeah, so she's <laughs> been at um, she's been away to college for one year now. Sure. Well, very good, very good. And at the, when did you decide to re-enter the um, 
the coding slash development uh, career community, whatever you want to call it? My daughter's senior year, I started thinking a lot about what I wanted to do next, knowing that it was going to free up quite a bit of time when she went off to college. And Mm -hmm. I was honestly, because I had been out of technology for 15 years, I just figured, oh, well, all my knowledge is, is just too out of date. I'll, you know, go down the street and get myself some kind of McJob. But it was just as she was entering college that I came across Moms Can Code. And it was all about, you know, moms learning how to code and uh, the opportunity to find, you know, part-time jobs or work from home employment that made me realize that I actually had skills that could still be relevant again. And I could more than likely, if I just reapplied myself to learning what's new out there, I could make the jump back in. And so it was definitely through the support of the Moms Can Code community that I did a complete turnaround and decided to actively pursue a more technical employment, even though it's part-time, and also to get involved in learning game engines again. Great, great. So uh, it sounds like you were, you were probably a member of the Moms Can Code community for a little while, and then now you're, you're actually a, uh, a part-time employee of, of Moms Can Code, correct? That is correct. All right. And what do you do for, for Moms Can Code currently? Um, I do two things for them. I'm a content editor, which means I uh, interview women and we post those interviews up on our blog. We talk to a lot of different women that are involved in technology and how they combine both, you know, working, coding. A lot of them are moms. A lot of them uh, have founded their own technical companies. So we share that as a source of real life inspiration. Also for Moms Can Code, I have done some webinars. I'm going to be, as an instructor, giving a course over the next few weeks on Unix and Terminal. Nice. That's that's always a, Unix and Terminal is always a nice introduction because the terminal itself, whether it's Unix or or Windows, and, and nowadays it's, it's all becoming Unix, even with Windows. Um, that command line usually is, is the base of everything. So that, that's going to be a real fundamental course. Yeah, and within the Moms Can Code community, as a member, not as an employee, I also try to host um, within our Slack channel a game development group to give those moms who might be curious about game development some, some exposure to what's what's out there and what would be involved if that was the path you wanted to pursue. Sure. Excellent. So um, go go ahead, Randy. Well, I was going to ask about the, what you're using now, like you mentioned unity and I guess C sharp. Is that what, like, I don't know much about the unity platform. I know people use it to build across multiple devices and platforms, but can you, I guess, just enlighten us on the benefits of Unity, why it's so popular, how like how you lead people into trying it out? Yes, so Unity as a game engine is an, an IDE, an integrated development environment. So there's, you know, when I bring up Unity, there are multiple windows. I get to see, you know, what user would see when they were playing the game, but also I could also look at, say, the entire level that I might be building. It's a way to pull in art assets, pull in sounds that are going to be run and loaded during in the game. And then what's called scripting is actually done in C sharp. That is the part that's actually coded. And a, a script might be a level manager that tells is telling the game when to switch levels. It might be the code for the player. Like in the case of the game I just made for the, uh, for the hackathon, 
there was a little penguin swimming around. So, you know, the, the penguin had a script that said, okay, when the user is pressing the up key, I'm swimming up. Mm -hmm. When the user presses a space bar, it's shooting out the little color ray. There's code for the, the sharks that the player interacted with. So the Unity game engine is just a way to integrate all of this for you to be able, you can play the game as you're building it within Unity, and then it gives you the opportunity to build to all those different platforms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm going to guess here, but uh, the tools now are better than when you were. I mean, do you find development easier to do now with the way that Unity, these tools are available? Or do you find it to be, because there's way more platforms now, I guess you have to kind of work towards what's your feeling on the state of these tools? I think it is definitely way more easier. It's so much more integrated than it was before when i was first programming computer games we would have it uh you know open up in visual c plus plus and use source safe to control our code but you always had to run the game and have a second monitor there to see what was going on mm -hmm. and sometimes like stepping through code or even now with Unity, you can step through frames of an animation. It is definitely a lot more powerful and much better integrated than it used to be. Yeah. So when it when when I so I just downloaded a game that that uses Unity as its engine, and I, I noticed that when it when it loads, it says uh, created with Unity or whatever the the terminology is. Um, the uh, the design. How much? How easy is it to find design assets? So for web pages, you need a designer um, or you use preloaded templates. Is it the same way with, with a game engine like Unity is you need someone who can design your, your assets or, or you can use pre-made assets? Is it very similar in that way? Yes, Unity has an asset store. That is where we got the assets for the game we did for the hackathon. You can, uh, some are free, some are low cost, some are expensive, but you can buy characters, you can buy backgrounds, just about anything you might want for the game. Uh, fortunately, the woman I was working with at the hackathon had some artistic talent, and so the art assets that weren't, weren't quite like in the right color that we needed, she could change those out for us. And for sounds, we went to, you know, various um, uh, sound source, you know, like freesound.org or whatever. I don't remember the specific name of it, but we got sound assets that way. Cool. So was so so let's talk a little bit about the uh, the game jam you went to. Um, how much preparation did you do going into that? What was the, it was, a, was it a week? Um, how, how, how'd the overall event go? The event started on Friday. There was a keynote speech in the morning and then no real activity until the evening when they provided dinner and announced the theme, which was complimentary colors. So they, they saved the announcement of the theme to the, to the actual start of the event and kind of gives you a jumping off place if you don't already have something in mind or if you do have a game in mind how how you're going to incorporate that uh, as far as preparation you know, once i guess i knew about a month ahead of time that i was going to do this so i just stepped up how how fast i was going through the udemy course on unity that was really about the only preparation I could make is just see how seeing how much more I could learn right up right up until uh, it started. Sure. And then um, so Friday night, once we knew the theme, uh, Andrea and I, you know, looked through the Unity assets. We found one that had you know these these cute penguins, sharks, you know, watery backgrounds, ice blocks, icebergs. And they were all bright, bright colors. We knew we could work with that 
that color theme. Mm -hmm. So then they give you uh, two days until Sunday evening. That's the pre-judging event. And you can, they have co-working spaces that you can work on on site, but Andrea is a mom. So it was actually better for us to work remotely from home. And we would use um, either Slack or video chat to talk about things as we were working. She did a lot of the level design. I was doing a lot of the programming. We presented the game. Uh, basically, it's a prototype of one level with a start screen and an end screen at the prejudging event, got some feedback. Mm -hmm. Then they give you the entire next week until Friday evening to polish up, put as much in your game as you can. We managed to add, get a tutorial level and a total of seven playable levels in during the week. Then at the Friday night judging event, they had tables set up. Everybody brought, every team would bring in a couple of computers, have your game playing. You got to play everybody else's game. You got to show off your own game. They even had live streaming and interviewing going on. The judges went around, looked at everybody's game. They announced some winners and it was a wrap. All right, very cool. So it sounds like it was it was an in-person local event to start. Um, and yep. then and then after the first weekend, everybody went away, went back to their lives, worked on it as much as they could. Um, that sounds like you might have had some that were able to put more time into it than others, depending on on their situation. But that's that's the the circumstances it was under how much time did you end up did you and and your partner end up putting into it during that week well since i ended up clearing my schedule and dedicating the whole week to it i am guessing i probably worked something like 60 hours on it it was pretty Oof, much wow. <laughs> it was pretty much from dawn to dusk i would in fact even when i was eating lunch um there was i had not quite got up to the point in the course I'm taking to really understand how to do animations, which is when you see a character on the screen in the case of our game, like the penguin swimming or the sharks biting. I had not reached that point, so I didn't really know how to do that yet. Mm -hmm. So when I would be taking lunch breaks or something, I would actually watch those courses. I would jump ahead jump ahead in what I was studying just for those lessons and I was learning as I go it was just it was really a wonderful experience that hackathon doing a project that wasn't just you know watch the lesson and do what the instructor does watch the lesson do what the instructor was here I had to take all of my pre-existing knowledge code snippets from the games I had made for the course and put these all together in something brand new. And as far as a learning experience was, that really cemented a lot of, of what I had learned in Unity during that, that time frame. Out of the time that you're describing this particular game, how would you slice that time up in terms of how you used it? And I'm kind of going down, like you mentioned animation, um, you know, graphic design and artistic talent versus the design of the game, the gameplay, the testing, like how would you, what do you feel like you spent your time on in, in those categories over that week? Well, I would say there was probably anywhere from a half an hour to an hour a day that was dedicated to, to design issues. Mm -hmm. Definitely the bulk of any day was programming, but it honestly was probably almost divided equally between actual gameplay and user interface, which seems kind of surprising, but there really is a lot of overhead in having your interface with a lot of buttons, with a lot of text on screen, with the the final screen giving your scores. 
I didn't personally do any of the level design. Andrea designed three levels and three or four levels and the others three or four were actually designed by my husband. He kind of got roped into that <laughs> at the last minute. Yeah. <laughs> because it, it was pretty easy to, to do it. We just would set him up with Unity and the code for the game. And as a level designer, really all you had to do is put a background down and then start placing either blocks that the penguin had to go around or sharks mm -hmm. or the color chain, you know, just elements like that. So it was really just, a, you know, a level designer just put stuff down like that. They would hand it off to us, you know, and we'd make sure the game would run properly with that. Okay. There was probably a, a couple of hours uh, dedicated to, to finding and plugging in the sounds. Mm -hmm. And when it came to testing uh, through, through Moms Can Code and the game dev Slack channel I have there, I just, I just put out there, you know, is anybody interested in t testing our game? And I got a response, uh, another woman on there, she and her three kids and even her husband took a go at it and gave us some feedback and I also roped in one of my friends who was uh, convalescing from a surgery for the previous week I uh, got her to agree to play too and the neatest thing about that was I got her to play on a peer one of those uh, video conferencing programs and she shared her screen so even though she was across town I got to watch her play and I got to see the things she would do and try that was, of course, unexpected. Yeah. You know, having having testers, especially once you're, you know, about halfway through what you're building is really good because people will always do things you're not expecting yeah. with your game. Well, that's almost every app in the world, I think. Users <laughs> yes. tell you where you what you don't know or things that you just never would guess they would try. They will definitely try it. Is in the game development um, community, like in our, some of the stuff we do, we have a lot of automated testing. And I don't know how that's really possible, like in gaming, but is there any such thing where you can write scripts that play your game just to make sure that some of the bugs you know about are tested over and over? Or is it pretty much a code it and release it, code it and release it, track the bugs that pop up. Like how does testing work in the typical gamer development process? I haven't gotten to that lesson in the course yet, but I had noticed that there was one coming up that at, that was going to address some, some automated testing. Mm -hmm. So I think there is some out there, but even then, you have to program the automated yeah. testing, which means you're expecting certain types of actions. Yep. So you can you can test for what's expected, but you can't really test for what's unexpected. Okay, makes sense. And that's that's usually where. So Randy's Randy's a much better automated tester than I am, um, and, and and that's where I struggle with with wrapping my head around testing myself, which is. Well, I can enter this test to say, if you click this button, get this response. And if you type text in this field, make sure it shows up here, so on and so forth. Um, and But you can't do the unexpected. I think the automated testing is really more to make sure the things that are working keep working. Yeah. Is that, is that a fair statement, Randy? I, yeah, definitely. Um, there's so many edge cases. At the unit testing level, it's pretty easy, but you don't do as much of that in a gaming environment, I, w I don't think. I th what's harder is the what like the integrated or acceptance testing where you are trying to mimic user interface type of interaction. And you really, like you have to test based on what you know the behavior to be. And in a way, like the attitude of testing is not to test everything 100% before you launch it. It's when a user brings to you a behavior that causes errors, then you create a new test to represent how they reproduced it. And then you ensure that it doesn't keep happening. So you 
are always building your test next to the application. But just like Renee was saying, in order to test, you have to code to test and you don't always have time to, to do double coding for everything you're trying to do. So you have to strike a balance there for sure. Sure. So, Renee, what you were saying about the the, the hackathon and, and or, or, or the game the game hackathon, it, it it just cements what I what I feel about about hackathons in general is they provide incentive, motivation, focus um, on a specific thing, um, which is sometimes what we all need in order to make that next step in our learning, um, which is the, the ability to say, you know what, I've got this hackathon this weekend. I need to brush up on my skills in whatever. And then in some hackathons, it's just a weekend and yours, it was, it was spread out over a, a whole week. Um, and then dedicate some time to that. And that really having a, a, a concrete project to really, focus all that energy on, I think just accelerates learning so much. Um, and that sounds like that's what you, uh, you were expressing was, was part of the benefit for you as well. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. I think that is definitely one of the top things I came out of from that hackathon was the fact that it really cemented what I had, I had learned. Cool. Cool. That is that. That's definitely the way I, I feel it goes. Um, so, what is what what's what's coming up for you as as a, as a returning game developer? Are are you going to work more on the Unity engine? Are you looking to? So, let me back step that back a minute. The name of your game is Art to Color. Um, are you going to work on that further and and release it as just something for for people to have fun with? Are you, are you going to take that any further, or are you just going to take the lessons from that and then apply it to something else? What's next for for you on that? Right now, Andrea and I still are working on Antarctic Color. We would like to get it to a point where we could release it for you know possibly even more than just for fun, but kind of depends on you know how, for how long we work on it and to, to what degree we fill it out if nothing else we've got it on simmer.io just as it currently exists especially since i know coming up i've got both another hackathon that might uh, pull me in a different direction sure so it what what did what did what are your future plans for 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 learning this? Is are are you interested? Are you are you heading after learning Unity well enough and and learning uh, this current mode of date game development to pursuing a full time job, pursuing a part time job, uh, open starting your own? What what's what's your what are your current plans as far as that goes? Well, there's really two different ways you can be involved in game development. You can be involved such as I was before, which is working full time for a game company that makes those games that show up on the shelves or now these days show up on Steam or on Xbox. But there's also what is known as the indie game development community. And these are people who, for the most part, are probably hobbyists doing this this on the side and they build games primarily for the love of it or maybe because it is so easy now to build a small game that gets released on mobile or released on steam that you know the, it's another way to go and it doesn't have to consume your whole life the way the full-time job and the push for the big game development does sure and there's a local indie game development community here called Bitbridge, which I found out about because I was tweeting about the game jam. Someone from Bitbridge noticed it and said, you know, hey, you should you should start coming to our events. And so I've been to one so far. It was what was called a feedback event. And the developers there 
um, would bring in their games and you could you could bring your game in or just show up and play other people's games and give them feedback on it. And I find that right now, it being involved in the indie game development, continuing to learn Unity on my own, and you know, maybe at some point just decide, you know, here's here's the game I would really like to make, and I am going to make it. Cool. That's what I'm Very doing. good. No, uh, that that sounds awesome. I, Randy and I are are, are both very much of the uh, of the make your own business mindset. So um, I, I'm excited to hear that that's the direction you're going. Yep. Um, and and that that certainly it, it's it's there, there there's a long walk walk ahead of you, but it sounds like you're certainly uh, more than capable of of knocking it out. Um, so what? Um, what I, I believe you mentioned that you were going to you're you're working on a Unity course for for Moms Can Code, um, is that correct? Uh, no, I am not. <laughs> okay. What what did I? I'm sorry, I miss I misspoke then. Uh, you're doing the Un, Unix and Terminal for for Moms Can Code. Yes, that is okay. I, I apologize. I, I sure. misremembered <laughs> that. Um, is that something you want to do in the future is, is possibly bring some of that knowledge to uh, moms can code. I I know you said you, there's already a game dev uh, community within the moms can code community. Oh yes. Absolutely. If I could get involved in something that would be teaching, teaching game development, or even if it was teaching something else like C plus plus using game development, that would definitely marry my two passions there. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. Very good. Um, the, the Unix terminal course, uh, is that under development? Is it already released? Where along the path are you on that one? Most of the course, uh, material has been provided by, uh, a free code camp that we're, uh, not not the free code camp. Most of the course material has been provided by a boot camp. It's part of their f- free online material. They have allowed us to use it in free courses that we might offer. So uh, the first one is going to be this Thursday. Then it's going to run over uh, s- several s- consecutive weeks, just as a a mini introduction. Okay. All right. Very cool. All right. Um, well, thank you for, for joining us today and, and talking to us about this. Uh, it, it's certainly a topic we hadn't, uh, we, we hadn't dived into cause we don't know anything about it. I've actually had a couple ideas ro- rotating in my mind about marrying, um, video games and Alexa voice commands. Um, so, so it certainly, uh, certainly something to, to circle back around on, uh, potentially in the future. Um, Randy, did you have anything else for Renee? Well, if anyone wants to get involved with your programs, what's the best way for them to contact you or Moms Can Code? Like, what's the best avenue to get started for someone that's looking to do what you're talking about? Well, I can be reached at on Twitter at Renee at MCC. And also Moms Can Code we have a Facebook group. We're also on Twitter as Moms Can Code PGH. And also there's a Moms Can Code website and members.momscancode.com is where you can actually sign up and join. Okay. We'll put those in our show notes. And then you did say the Antarctic color is on simmer. Um, would you like to share that with the listeners? Have them uh, mess around with it and and see what you built. Yes, absolutely. That okay. is. I will. 
have to find that real quick. We 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 can uh, we can grab that URL from you. We can put that in the show notes as well, so that uh, people okay, can grab that and and go try it out. I've tried it out, and and um, you have to know your complementary colors in order to succeed. So the tutorial helps <laughs> you with that, but um, you do have to know your complementary colors. So um, I think that's all we had for today. Renee, thank you again uh, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Don and Randy, for having me. Definitely. And, and I think that's it for today. So we will talk again next time. Great. Later. Bye. Thanks for listening to This Old App. Show notes and previous episodes can be found on our website at www.thisoldapp.online. Reviews on Apple iTunes are always appreciated and help promote the show. For questions, comments, or things you would like to hear on future shows, please email us at hello at thisoldapp.online. Show music is Guns Blazing by Fab Claxton, licensed by Pond5. Voiceover work by MeganVoices.com. You'll hear from us soon. <laughs>